First thing is, um, we're, we're a fairly large group, and also people hate asking questions. And even though you get free food, I guess it's, it's not enough of an incentive to ask questions. So um, one of the things we thought we could do is do Slido. I don't know if you guys have used Slido, but if you go on slido.com, and when you go there, when it asks you for a hashtag, um, just insert BLC. We tried to put in blockchain, but it wouldn't take it. OK, just BLC. Um, you can, as we're speaking, if there's any questions you want to ask, including when is this going to finish, because it's so boring, um, uh, please, please, please do that. And we might even be seeing them online later. So be careful about what you, what you write, actually. OK, but um, so as we're going through, questions that way. And at the end of it, um, we're, going to ask, we're going to ask you questions and try and get a reaction from you on a couple of key things which the report proposes and which we feel quite passionate about, actually. And seeing we're here at the European Commission, and the report was primarily written for the European Commission, um, we'd like to get some instant feedback on, on that one. Okay, So asking questions, answering questions, that's what we're going to do. OK, um, the report. It was supposed to be a small report. In fact, when, when, when Yves Bunin and Andrea told, you know, contacted me in the first place, they said, can you do a small, short report about this stuff? Um, because most people get it, don't they? Or if they don't, it should be sh short. Um, seven months later, um, I don't know how many people we spoke to. Um, experts, people in the field, from Microsoft to MIT Media Lab to people developing things, um, the more we dug in, the more we couldn't get out of the wormhole, almost. Okay, So it got to that stage where we said, we've got to try and get some closure on this one. The, the interesting one is that we were choosing, you know, chasing a moving target. I was listening to what Constantine was saying about uh, get rich quickly. Anthony and I were saying, well, you must be investing, I guess, somewhere. Um, because the first thing that people, when people talk about the blockchain, the first thing they tell you, it's, it's fintech. And it's a bubble, and it's bust, and uh, crooks. Um, Bitcoin hype. It's the domain of fraudsters and uh, crypto culture. It's illegal. Why not is the EU looking at this very soon? This will be illegal. Stop wasting your time. Uh, nothing to do with education. Of course, that was the other interesting one. And, and I guess this was in terms of talking to some QA people around, around Europe, it was the case. You had either draw a blank, or else you get those things, or else you're told um, it's, it's just one for the future. Yeah, just, just leave me alone. You come back to me in five years' time. The whole market will stabilize, and everything will be fine and, uh, and hunky-dory. Um, the reality is that the EU has been looking at this for a while. And you know, if you start searching, you know, in 2016, it's quite interesting, the blockchain for social good. Nothing to do with cryptocurrencies here and fraudsters and things like that. And I guess, you know, if you go down to 2018 now, if you look at what the commission is doing in terms of its observatory um, and forum and uh, the, the, the blockchain observatory and forum, it's part of the press. It just took two years to get there, I guess, which is not bad, I guess, by, you know, by, by you know, getting it through the process, I guess, and getting something done quickly. But I'm, I'm trying to emphasize first this whole thing about speed, which is, you know, here we are, all of us, you know, policymakers and administrators, and, and we need to do things calmly. Out there, it's not calm at all. And if you look at what the media is, is saying, and again, you know, looking at The Guardian, blockchain so much bigger than Bitcoin. And you now have funded things like Blockchain in Society. It's a group, a bunch of lawyers in Amsterdam, funded by EU money, looking at the interaction, I guess, you know, in the old days we used to have media and society, it's now the blockchain and society, isn't it? Which we thought was quite interesting. And these are, you know, this is quite new. This is after we actually produced the project. Banks talking about blockchain, the new technology of trust. I should read this out to you, actually. A new technology is redefining the way we transact. If that sounds incredibly far-reaching, that's because it is. Blockchain has the potential to change the way we buy and sell, interact with government, and verify the authenticity of everything from property titles to organic vegetables. Yeah? It combines the openness of the internet with the security of cryptography to give everyone a faster, safer way to verify key information and establish trust. 
which kind of goes against it's a bubble, it's fraudsters, it's crooks, it's going to happen tomorrow. That's Goldman Sachs. And I guess if, if, if you have Stephen B. Johnson, who's a major academic, okay, who once wrote a book called Everything That's Bad Is Good For You, um, and he's saying, yeah, beyond the Bitcoin bubble, yes, it's driven by greed, but the mania for cryptocurrency could wind up building something much more important than wealth. I guess this is now part of the vernacular, isn't it? We seem to be at this kind of tipping point. We have countries like mine that the prime minister announced probably about seven months ago that A, we're going to have a national blockchain strategy. B, we will become the blockchain island. Um, this is what Stephen Johnson said, though, which is quite interesting. He said, if there's one thing we've learned from the recent history of the internet, it's that something esoteric, same, seemingly esoteric decisions about software architecture can unleash profound global forces once the technology moves into wider circulation. So just to bring this to a loop, we're here primarily talking about a technology, a disruptive technology, as opposed to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and whether, whether Constantine can become rich very quickly. Okay, that's, that's not what we're doing here. Over to you. Okay, so it's about time that maybe we explain a little bit what a blockchain is. Now, a blockchain is actually something extremely, extremely simple. It is what's called a public decentralized ledger. And the ledger is simply enough a very special kind of spreadsheet that only contains one type of information, which is person A transferred this object to person B at this time. That's it. So why on earth is the entire world going crazy about a new technology to record ledgers? And conceptually, what you have to understand is that ledgers are the founding technology of capitalism. Ledgers are what make the transfer of capital possible. They are what record who owns what at what time, who transfers what to who at what time. And since essentially our entire economy and most of our society is built on top of that technology, what we're talking about here is actually messing with one of the very, very basic technologies which practically anything you can come in contact with in modern life has some connection to. So this is why technologically blockchain is such a big deal. Now, what is different though about a public decentralized ledger? So what you have on the screen is the structure of a modern database. So whatever type of database you use, let's take an educational example. So you have a database of credentials, for example. Users have information. So I have information about my grades and so on and so forth. If you have thousands of students, all with grades, those grades are stored inside a central database. And that central database, in uh, an electronic sense, in the end, is a box in a basement in a data center somewhere. That box, that database, is controlled by somebody. Usually, in this example, by the institution that issues the grades. And that institution controls who has access to that information, the rules under which that information is stored, and so on and so forth. If a third party wants to access that information in the database, they need to go through the person that controls the database. So if I want access to those grades, I have to ask the institution. Maybe the institution might make it automatically or freely accessible, but that is their decision. And that is essentially how every type of information is stored on the modern web, in a centralized database, stored and controlled by somebody. Now, a question to you in the room, do you see any weaknesses with this structure? What are the problems in having all your data stored in one place and having that data controlled by one organization? Any ideas? So people can change the data? What else? 
database may break down and then you lose all the data. The database may break down. What about by the concept of having the one person controlling all the data? What problems might you see there? Human mistake, basically. Human mistake. OK, so we're going in the right direction. And if we look at what can go wrong, there are actually essentially five categories of things can go, go wrong. One you've mentioned already, data can be changed. Now, it can be changed by somebody corrupt within the organization, or it can be hacked externally. Data can be deleted. And every electronic database there is, in the end, is susceptible to deletion. In an educational context, one of the examples uh, we like to mention at the moment, imagine the war in Syria, which essentially destroyed credential records across the country. If we think the institution can prevent access. So, for example, uh, Educational institutions now collect a lot of metrics about the student population. Uh, especially if you're doing online learning, there might be hundreds of data points collected about you. If you ask to see that, that is in the hands of the institution. Institutions can put conditions on access. So they say, yes, absolutely, you, might ha you can have a copy of your certificate, uh, but uh, we want 100 euros, or you cannot have a copy of your certificate, or other types of conditions. If you look at credit card companies, they charge on average 3% of every transaction done with a credit card anywhere just for the privilege of accessing their database. And finally, the institution can use the data in an unauthorized manner. So we're already entering discussions about if you're storing large quantities of student data, for example, how are you, if you want to do research on that, what sort of conditions are put on the research, is that sold to marketers, is it shared to third parties, etc., etc. So these are all things that can go wrong with a centralized data model. Now, simply enough, blockchain removes every one of these problems. Um, it is a technology that gets rid of the central database and gets rid of the central person controlling database and yet still lets you have an accurate, trusted ledger. And by removing the central point of failure, you remove all these problems. So a very, very, very simple primer on how this happens. The simple technology of blockchain is that instead of having all the information going into one central server, every user who uses the database will actually keep a complete copy of the database on their machine. And every transaction that is made by any person is updated to every computer in the network. So that is the essential technology behind blockchain. Again. This may sound simple until you think that a large network could have thousands or millions of nodes, that not all these computers will be online at the same time. Even if they were online at the same time, if you're having hundreds of transactions a second, a millisecond uh, delay across a fiber optic cable would mean that one transaction comes in before the other. So technologically, being able to just synchronize every one of these copies is something that until today basically wasn't possible. So by having a copy of the database in each place and by ensuring that all of these are synchronized, it means that if you destroy one copy, all the others are still in existence. If I want to hack it, I can hack my copy, but I would have to hack every copy on every computer simultaneously to actually change the main record. If I want to access this in an unauthorized manner, the same. So by creating these multiple copies in the multiple places, you get a very, very solid, trusted database. So that's enough about the technology of it, though. And we'll talk a little bit about where that leads. OK, one of the things about this is it, it sounds very technologically deterministic, isn't it? You know, all of us who used to do some of the media studies in the, in the past, isn't it? Um, I teach media literacy in my university. And what we put down here is really the social value proposition of the blockchain. Anybody who's got a bit of an education bent in their bones will relate, we think, to some of these things. So let's pull away from the technology. 
the notion of self-sovereignty and identity are pretty much intertwined. <coughs> self-sovereignty is about power. So back to your old Foucault, <laughs> you know, Anthony was talking about certificates, the institution, wanting to go and do a PhD when he used to be a chartered accountant, like I was once, and I had to write to the FCCA, who then spent about three weeks before they gave me a transcript of whatever I did 25 years before, when I was doing something else in my life, okay? And I was starting to get pretty annoyed, actually, because that's, you know, that was my life. I just want to get on to the next phase. Who am I? Who's got the power in this particular case, okay? When it comes to something as simple as certificates, remember, the notion of a certificate has not gone away since Victorian days. My father has, you know, in his house, my PhD certificate and my brother's PhD certificate is some sort of sense of social capital because he was uneducated. That hasn't gone away. And yet, if I look at it, it's almost like, who does that certificate belong to, me or the institution? What if the institution burns down? We have cases like that in Malta because we're on the Sub-Saharan Trail where people end up from Syria, ending up in Malta, saying, I am a doctor. Prove to me that you are. Where are your records? So one of the projects that we're actually going to have in Malta is reconstructing the records of people like that and then notarizing it on the blockchain once and for all. Okay. So there's a very moral kind of streak attached to this, which for us was very, for us, I'm saying, us, the community of people who are looking at this, not as a way of let's get rich quickly, but let's put this technology first to simple good use. Okay. The notion of identity is very much intertwined. I may get records from an institution. Do I want to share all of those records at the same time? Do I want to share the certificate at the same time as a transcript? Identity online. Am I who I am? Am I a boy or a girl? Has something been hacked? So again, when you start to mix self-sovereignty, power, power moving now from the institution to the learner, to the recipient, and that as long as when the certificate gets notarized on the blockchain, the two parties do something. One, there's the private key and the public key, both get activated. Power moves from the institution to the learner forever. Trust, who do you trust? And we haven't spoken about hacking. When we were speaking to MIT Media Lab, one of the first reasons why they started looking at this was <laughs> purely because there's so much hacking going on in terms of, you know, I have a PhD from MIT Media Lab and, uh, there are some very great forces. So that's how they started, in a way, by trying to fix a problem that they had. This is a pretty good way of making sure that that covenant of trust, which happens at the end of a journey, of a, of a journey, you know, I now have my PhD. Did I really do the work that I did? Did it actually happen? So again, that's a very strong element in terms of trust attached to the blockchain. And then the opposite. <coughs> Transparency, provenance, are you who you are? All of these, these things, these, these, you know, what we call social values, they seem to be very ephemeral, aren't they? But remember, we, we all as parents invest huge sums of money to get our kids educated because we trust the system. And yet we know that the system, the way it is right now, is open to flaws. Okay? The idea that the blockchain helps in terms of the transparent, lifelong learning journey. Again, I will pause on this. We all know that the notion of education as it stands now is going to be severely disrupted. Whether we, you talk about it in our, you know, our working group or the higher education people, if you look at the US, it's, you know, we're going towards the plug and play model. Okay. My 15 and a half year old now tells me, do you think it's a good idea going to university? Shouldn't I just get on a plane somewhere and go and start my project? And am I going to get a return on my investment? So in the future, we all know that education is going to be part of bits and pieces of parcels. We also know that the notion of education in terms of get educated, you have one career in your life, is going to go away. You will have multiple careers, like I've had. Okay. Immutability. Then, the other side. Can't be changed. Locked. Here it is. Here's the certificate. I received it. It's locked. It can't be hacked. Can't be changed. That's it. Over and done with. And then for old hippies like us, I guess. Yeah, the idea of not having an intermediary. I mean, what a surprise. The banks are nervous. 
that the big software houses are nervous or trying to close down the software, the idea of not needing an intermediary, a gatekeeper, because it's not the institution as such as the gatekeepers, the other intermediaries that have come about. Okay? The idea of this intermediation, we suggest, should be very compelling to the EU at this particular juncture in the evolution of things like the internet, I guess. You're in this? Okay, so we start talking about education, and we say what actually can be done with this. And we're going to be presenting to you two things. First of all, what is being done now, and then in a few minutes we'll be talking about what are the future potentials. And like with any new technology, what is being done right now is relatively low-hanging fruit. So uh, we've got this database where we can store information and we can store this information permanently and we can do it in a way that it will be never deleted. And one of the things people started thinking is it would be really interesting to use this to secure digital documents, such as certificates of any kind, including educational certificates. I won't get into this diagram in a lot of detail, but there's one technological concept you need to understand to understand why all these privacies come. And that is that digitally, it is possible to put any digital object through a piece of software that will produce what is called a hash of that document. And you can think of the hash as an identity number for a digital document. Now, if I put the same document into hash software, I will always get the same ID. And it doesn't matter how big the document is, I will always get the same 256-bit ID. Um, however, if I only have the ID, it is absolutely mathematically impossible to reconstruct the document from it. Just the same as if I was to give any of you an ID number, each time I meet you, I'll say, yes, that is your ID number. But if I only have the ID number and no other piece of information, it is impossible to guess that you are the person that stands behind the ID number. And it's, impossible. it's important to understand that you can do this with any digital document. So to certify or to put a certificate on the blockchain, nobody actually stores the certificate on the blockchain. Blockchains are not file stores. They are ledgers, as explained. But what you can do is store the hash of a digital document on the chain, which means if I issue you a certificate and I write that you got grade A in this subject on the certificate, then I run this certificate through the hash and I will state on the blockchain that I transfer document with this hash to you. If you go and show that document to an employer and you change that A to a B and then they run it through hash software, they'll get a completely different identity number. They won't get the number that matches the one on the blockchain, so they will know it is a fake. If, on the other hand, I give them the original document, the ID will match and they'll know that that is an original document. And that is how authentication works on the blockchain. This is a diagram from Learning Machine, which is one of the companies promoting a uh, certificate service on the blockchain and who launched the BlockCert standard. And this gives you an idea of the levels that goes into it. So the top level, the presentation layer, if you will, that is what you would call a normal PDF style graphical certificate which somebody might award you. Beneath that, you have computer readable information. So you would have the metadata of, with all the fields and all of this in uh, machine codes that can be read by a database. The new thing for blockchain is that you then have the third layer underneath that where all of that is compressed into that digital key and stored on the blockchain to ensure that that digital record is a true digital record. And so essentially, all the certificate solutions we're about to present to you all use a variation of this storing exclusively the hash of the certificate onto the chain. And they're sprouting every day. Okay, so here's one called Accredible. So if you go onto accredible.com, 
you a bit about what's happening closer to our patch because I, I have some first-hand experience in, in, in this and, and I'm speaking to Gartner next week because they're also looking at nation states that are trying to use the blockchain on a, on a bigger, wider basis. I mean, the first thing you notice is they're using pretty much old technology, aren't they, to sign? Okay, so you've got, you've got the permanent secretary, Frank Fabry, Dan Hughes from, uh, from Learning Machine, the minister, and the, and the uh, parliamentary secretary in, in charge of digital education. Um, the interesting thing is that right now, um, certificates are being produced and notarized on the blockchain um, at the Institute for Tourism Studies, Malta College for Arts, Sciences and Technologies, National Commission for Further and Higher Education will be coming on stream in a couple of months' time. There will be every single institution that has got a certificate to operate in Malta will have those certificates notarized. I told you about the other project, which will be the reconstruction of people who don't really have, who are deemed to be in a traditional framework to having complete records. And these people will try and once and for all make sure that those records are there and are future-proof. Back to the whole social function of it. And all state schools, kids who can potentially leave compulsory education um, at the age of 15 will also be given a school leaving certificate. One of the things we're going to do here, by the way, is I was asking uh, <laughs> Constantine and I guess Simone in terms of if we get your emails, um, we will also, just for fun, issue a certificate for this learning session <laughs> and notarize it on the blockchain. Okay, and we'll do that together with, uh, with, with Learning Machine because at the moment we have a working relationship with them. Now, the one thing to understand is these kind of things happen on a nation state basis because you need to engage a lot of stakeholders who all have very different agendas at the same time. Now, in small states like ours, maybe like Slovenia, like maybe Estonia, and uh, Maybe it's easier to get the decision makers. I can tell you, everybody had a different idea of the agenda as to why this thing was a good idea from the prime minister's office that said, our vision is for a blockchain island, whatever that means. But I think really they were looking at fintech all the way down to where I was operating. As yes, somebody was working closely with the minister, but the minister bought into that ideology I was sharing with you at the very beginning because he's a teacher. And that's what he wanted. And he said, if you can give me something that is future-proof and we are seen as government to really start saying, this is the way we used to do things. It's not just technological determinism. We really believe that, A, the certificate is not going to go away, but here's a new way of, I guess, recognizing, credentialing the fact that we are going to have this plug-and-play education model. You see, I mean, you don't just look at formal academic education. Look at informal learning, non-formal learning, even professional learning. If you have a, I don't know, a certificate from Cisco, it might not be deemed to be recognized by some institutions. So our vision is that everything will be collected during this lifelong learning journey um, on the blockchain. Um, plug, and I'll repeat the plug, this is a working lab happening in Malta. So there are people coming in, um, looking at what we're doing. Uh, we're speaking to other nation states, the Dutch. We're going to have uh, a conference on the 17th and 18th of May where we're going to use the notion of, you know, both the blockchain in education and the whole notion of connected learning, just in case some of you guys might be interested in that. Knowing the, how dodgy the internet connection is here, I'm not going to try this out, but once we do share the PDF on this. The certificate on the right side, okay, which says, here's a certificate from the Institute for Tourism Studies, and there's a name there, okay. Um, if you click on that, you'd get a live version of that certificate. If you copy the URL and then go on to blockcerts.org, cut and paste the URL, you can notarize it on the blockchain. And, okay, so you can actually go and say, verify it, and it will become up as a verified certificate. Okay. It's a bit clunky at the moment, but these things are getting much better. So you will see some of the new startups, in a way, that are getting very cool at this kind of interfaces. Now, again, why Malta went for this solution was simply an opposition with open standards. And that's one of the things that Tony, Tony will be talking about as well, the whole idea about standards open versus closed. Bloxus at the moment is the only known open standard where the code is available 
via GitHub, and then it's up to people whether to go in and use that or close it. Okay, so it's something which we need to uh, talk about. Over to you. So the idea of having basically undeletable, unhackable certificates uh, is relatively cool, but probably not cool enough to justify quite as much hype as blockchain has been getting. So in the next slides, we'll be just presenting you some ideas of what can be done with blockchain with a few more years of development. Now, I say a few more years of development, but for every idea I'll be presenting, there is already a startup which is raising money to do it, and I'll actually be showing you those slides. Uh, I do have to vouch that I don't actually know any of these startups personally, and uh, blockchain is the Wild West, and some of them might disappear in a month and take people's money with them. So I am not particularly recommending any of these, but the point of the examples will just be to show you the range of applications people are already working on today. Now, there are four big areas where blockchain could have an application. And essentially, anywhere that you already use as a ledger in education can have a blockchain application. So first is the issue and recognition of credentials, management of intellectual property, payments for education, and management of student data. Now, what I'm going to do is give one example of what is possible under each of these categories. If you find any of them interesting, there are uh, another four scenarios in our report, but it would just take too long in person to go through four of them. So for issue and recognition of credentials, and I'm sorry about all the text on the slide, um, we said that it might be interesting to explore what blockchain for ECTS could look like. Now, ECTS is actually a perfect candidate for a blockchain implementation because it already has a currency. It already is in form of tokens, which are transferred from one person to another, and where those tokens have equivalent value. So it essentially, the word currency is the key one here. You have got cryptocurrencies, crypto educational currency. What we were mentioning before is what makes blockchain very interesting. Why isn't there already a database of everybody's ECTS in Europe? And that hasn't really been a technological challenge. It's been more of a governance challenge. As soon as you say we would store everyone's ECTS, but who would run it? Who would control it? Who would the stakeholders be? Uh, how do you protect the data? How do you deal with the data protection issues? And there you go down the rabbit hole. Blockchain makes some of these things easier. First of all, because no single person or institution controls the database. So you could imagine a database that is controlled collectively by all institutions that issue ECTS, by the universities. So you would be a member of the network by running a blockchain node that issues ECTS. The rules of the network are relatively easy because they are hard-coded into the software. The rules under which you can issue one are hard-coded into the software. If you want to change those rules, you have to get at least 50% of the members of the network to change the software and upgrade it. That is how changes are made in the blockchain network. So you've got the democracy of the organization built into the software, no need for one contractor, one organization to manage all of it. Um, but would a ECTS database be of any use on the blockchain? Now, first of all, you have the immutability issue. So those would be undeletable, they would be there forever. But also, you could imagine that transfer of credits between institutions could be automated. The rules of the Erasmus agreement could just be programmed into the chain and that transfer would happen automatically. You could imagine that issue of degrees based on specific credits could be automated. You could also deal with the problem of double spending where people might try and use the same credits as part of degrees in different countries. And one of the things for employers, you present your CV and your list of a credit to an employer, one click, and they would have it automatically verified. No need to contact the institution, no need to check with the institution if those are real. Your certificate itself would have proof of its uh, reality in the certificate itself. And that would make uh, human resource systems and so on far, far, far more efficient. So 
One of the people that are playing around with this is actually the University of Maribor in Slovenia, and they've actually rolled out a uh, blockchain for ECTS pilot. So far, the only university on it is the University of Maribor, but the code is running, the machines are running for this. Second scenario, under intellectual property, is blockchain for open educational resources. So, one of the interesting things is that uh, within universities, essentially your promotions and your career depend on how much you publish, and how much you publish research in academic journals. Um, one of the problems we constantly deal with with open educational resources is if you create an excellent piece of teaching material, and it's used by 10,000 teachers all over Europe, that will mean absolutely nothing for your career. And the reason it'll mean absolutely nothing for your career is because nobody has taken the trouble to track that intellectual property and to record its usage. Now, of course, there are companies that do this sort of thing. The big educational public, the big educational tracking powerhouses, the Pearsons of this world and so on, which do it for journals. But to create the system for open educational resources, you would either need to spend a ridiculous amount of money to actually create the tracking system, or you would have to entrust it to a private organization like this with all the problems that has in terms of the publishing model, in terms of closing things up so they could have a business model. Blockchain, again, changes that equation. You could imagine a repository of citations, except citations of teaching material created, that would be created by a network of libraries or a network of universities. Again, no central authority uh, controlling it, no central authority charging for it, no central authority telling you who owns the IP, just run by the repositories themselves. And that would mean that you could actually record each use of teaching materials, you could record the citations, and you could imagine a world where you're getting an impact factor index based on the teaching materials you produce and not just on the research materials you produce. And we would actually be able to have a quantitative way of measuring uh, academic excellence from a teaching standpoint. This isn't quite the same thing, but one of the examples of something being done along this, this is Everypedia. Everypedia is a clone of Wikipedia except it is linked to a blockchain, and edits which are made are actually paid in tokens. The longer your edit stays, and the better your edit stays, the more token you get, the more reputation you get on the platform, and they are also linking this to their advertising model. So the money the company gets in is then distributed to the editors based on their score and based on how good their edits are. So this is already a model of blockchain that's working, that is actually giving you some sort of credit and tokens for creating content. A third example, here we're talking about funding, payments and smart contracts. Now, of course, the most simple, simple, simple you can imagine is you could pay for your tuition fees in Bitcoin. Um, however, as many of you know, the idea of voucher funding is spoken about a lot in Europe. And if you're going to think of a system of voucher funding for education, one of the problems with any type of voucher funding is simply enough that you have to create an entire administration to go with it. A uh, second problem is that promises that are made to students that we will fund you based on certain conditions and we will fund you seven, eight years into the future aren't always kept when political circumstances change. Now, one of the cool things about uh, blockchains is that you can store what are called smart contracts on them. So instead of storing, I am transferring one credit to you, I can also store the statement, I will transfer this credit to you when you fulfill these conditions. It's storing a small program on it. But again, remember, once you've stored it on there, you cannot change it. It's immutable, it's there. So you could imagine a group of public authorities, universities, even private funders getting together and saying, you know what, the payments for students in this educational system will happen on a custom blockchain. And then you can program whatever you want into the smart contracts, depending on what your model is. You can just say, listen, for every student that enrolls in your university, the university will automatically get transferred this amount. You can say that this private funder will transfer this amount to this student, but only when they reach certain grades. You can do any combination of this, 
But effectively, because of this feature that you program in the conditions under which the money is transferred, you basically can create these more sophisticated funding systems and you can create them without the administration building to go with it, or at least without most of the administration building to go with it. Um, this, in terms of startups, and this in particular, I would warn that there are a lot of startups doing the same thing. There are at least three or four different startups that are actually trying to launch education portals with payment systems based on blockchain. Uh, BitDegree is the latest one I found, but there's at least three or four others that are effectively doing the same thing. Uh, generally, I would feel that though the nation state uh, application is a much, much more interesting one. And then we come up with the fourth scenario, blockchain for student ID. So we've been talking about self-sovereignty. And one of the interesting things you can do with blockchain is that you can use this concept of hashing to actually store a student identity. Now, the best analog in the physical world for this is actually going to a music festival. If you go online to register for a music festival, they're going to take a lot of personal information, your name, your credit card, sometimes your age, sometimes your country. They need a whole pile of information just to give you the ticket. You register, and they tell you, we're not actually giving you a ticket. You just have a, uh, you have a paper, which you can go. You then go to the festival, you take the paper, and you exchange that for a bracelet. Now, what has happened there? The person who gives you the bracelet has access to your personally identifiable information. But then they put a bracelet that has some sort of lock on it, so only you can use it. And for the rest of the festival, nobody has to ask you your name. Nobody has to ask you any of the information they collected. You can identify yourself within the festival just with that bracelet. And effectively, when we talk about self-sovereign identity using the blockchain, we're talking about something similar. So you can imagine a student applying for university. Let's say that they're applying for some sort of a grant because they're from a lower socioeconomic group. The admissions office will want reams of data to verify that. They'll want your parental income. They'll want proof of it. They'll want to know where you're from. All sorts of information you probably don't want to give out to other people. At the moment, the admissions office stores that on the central server, and then the university decides who has access to that. But the number of people who have access to that is a lot. And effectively, any computer that is attached to that network, which in a university is thousands upon thousands of computers, a skilled hacker can get through to that data. And we're hearing one after another after another breaches of that sensitive information. So in the blockchain one, instead, the admissions office would verify the information. They would check this is true. And they would say, you are eligible to this sort of grant. And what they would do is they would do two things. They would take all the information you've given them, and they would store the hash of that information on the blockchain. And they would also store a statement saying, you are eligible to uh, subsidize student uh, housing and books. And then they would delete all the original information from their servers. With that on my phone, for example, I can go to the library, and I say, look, I have the certificate verify myself with my fingerprint on the phone, and show that I have right to subsidized uh, books or subsidized housing, all without giving my name or any of my information. If at any point somebody has says, but wait a minute, you have faked this pass. This isn't really you. All I have to do is take the original data, pass it back through the hash generator, and prove that the hash matches the blockchain. But again, to prove that my information is real, I don't need to share it with a single human being. I can prove the original data that I submitted to that admissions office and that was verified them without showing it to another person all the way through. So it's the equivalent of effectively, if we go back to our example of the bracelet in the music festival, if you're really, really good at the music festival, you can find a way to pass the bracelet onto a friend. But Imagine the bracelet with a fingerprint reader built into it, and that's effectively what you can get with blockchain uh, secured identities. Again, one of the big startups that's working in this, they're not doing this for education, they're doing it for any type of company that needs to manage large amounts of data, is Civic, and they call these concepts secure identity ecosystems. And my slides just 
disappeared from the screen entirely. Okay, got them. Okay, I don't know what your energy levels are like. How much time do we have? We're still on a good time. Okay, that's cool. By now, you should be thinking about is blockchain good, is blockchain bad? Is it gray? Does it have any relevance to us? Okay. And uh, we, we, we kind of coyly put this down as actors, note the, the kind of language we're using. Actors in blockchain do not always have aligned interests. And uh, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about an open blockchain, a closed blockchain, a hybrid blockchain, whether hybrids are in the uh, public interest or not. What should the EU be talking about in this brave new world? So there we're looking at dangers and opportunities of the blockchain. Um, last year, I was on a podium in Salt Lake City at the ASU GSV summit talking about blockchain. And next to me, there was Microsoft, who are doing a lot of stuff on the blockchain, waiting for major announcements. We were talking about IBM. Sony, there was the University of Cyprus that started doing stuff on block certs, but are kind of hedging their bets that have a master's in cryptocurrency, so they have a certain interest in using this technology. And they were saying that they're using the whole notion of cryptocurrencies because a lot of their students seem to come from places like Africa where they don't have enough money to pay immediately, so they're getting bits and pieces of money as they go along. Okay? People with a vested interest, people from Learning Machine. And, and Michael Casey, who's a, who's a writer on all things blockchain, MIT Media Lab, and he said, you know, what at the moment, let's see how this thing aligns somehow. But from his point of view, that's pretty much my point of view, is we should fight for the openness. We should examine the hybrid ones, the closed ones. Let's see how this is going to work out. Um, Here's, for example, is Sony. Sony developed system for authentication, sharing, and rights management using blockchain technology. Guess what? On the other side, it's all hyperlinked, by the way. It says, Sony's unleashing a new patent application with the use of blockchain as part of its educational platform. So open is about to be closed very soon. I don't know if Microsoft will bundle some wonderful new blockchain thing onto its Windows 11 for all I know. That's the end of the story, maybe, isn't it? But maybe it doesn't matter because you trust the Microsofts more than you would trust other entities and all these startups. Here's the dilemma we have. I mean, in our report, we, tried to, we adapted a slide that we found from Chris Jaggers. And we tried to say, you know, if you look at vendor independence on one side, proof of existence, the vendor as a notary, know your customer, and the self-sovereign identity ideologues, I guess who are really trying to fight for the notion of, you know, build this for the learner. You know, I mean, at the moment, besides the learning machine, the block certs and the consensus and the U-ports, everybody else, you know, there are people who took the open and, and, and closed it. Um, there are some people who are, you know, hovering somewhere in, in between. So this is the, the dilemma that we have right now. Who do you trust? Hello? Can you maybe just say what you mean by open and closed? What is just the thing? Oh, well, I mean, I um, open source Linux. Think in terms of the old Linux debate, yeah? Linux, open source. Closed Microsoft, I guess. That would be an analogy, isn't it? You pay for a license. I mean, Microsoft will tell you that, you know, they're going to have open APIs, but most of the technology has been developed by them. Bloxers, on the other side, has been a whole movement of geeks working together, sponsored by MIT Media Lab, continued by Learning Machine. So if anybody wants to go and take that code, they can do things with it. Some people are already commercializing it. So these grad-based guys, and, you know, would I blame them? You know, you can make hay while the sun shines. You might be bought out, for all I know. But the whole dynamic, and I'm not necessarily saying good, bad, whatever it is, but that's, that's the landscape. That's where we are right now. When Anthony was talking about the whole Wild West issue, you know, at some stage, there's going to be license fees that need 
need to be paid. So that's the first thing which comes to mind. This looks very complicated, and I don't know if you can see it, and most of you are facing the wrong way because the screens are on that side. So it's like an eye test. But I will, I will take you through three things that we, we basically calling Internet 1, Internet 2, and Internet 3. So let's start from there, okay? So Internet 1 used to be the vision of the open web. All of those of us who are of a certain age, that's what, that's what we subscribe to, okay? The old Stuart Hall thing, information wants to be free, yeah? Built on open protocols, a lot of scientists and academics and dreamers around it. Applications involved one-way data. It was pretty much decentralized. Anybody has the ability to create wealth by building internet applications, and in fact, millions of people did so. Okay. Internet 2 is pretty much where we are right now, I guess. Where the internet is what? Social media? The social web? If we have a president that says that without Twitter, he would not have been elected. That's where we are, right? Internet too, the social well, web, build on closed protocols. So the dream of the open internet, well, now the internet, those of us who look at it in a certain way think it's been hegemonized by the Facebooks, the Googles, the Apples, and the Amazons of this world, Silicon Valley platforms, owned by corporates. Applications involve transactions between huge numbers of people built on the freemium model, yeah? Very centralized. Top five internet companies have a value of $3 trillion between them. Internet three, future gazing. Okay. So we, you know, we started to look into the future. Okay? So we're talking about potentially the blockchain web. Think of where we started from today in this lecture, right? Stephen Johnson saying, it looks like it's owned by crooks. It can be done, you know, a lot of bad things, but a lot of good things can happen. And that reminds us of a certain age. These kind of, this kind of discourse was also prevalent when internet first showed up and porn <laughs> was the first application. Yeah? So the choice now is between these open and closed protocols. So that's why we're trying to give you a snapshot. And by the way, that, that little chart would be out of date now. There are new things sprouting every day. Something pops up on my Twitter feed or somebody approaches Anthony and I and say, you guys did that report. Would you like to help us do X and Y and Z? That's where we are. Okay. Um, initially, the people who are involved in it are scientists, but increasingly corporates, startups. There are a million fintech experts who are into this. Okay. Applications involve transactions between large numbers of people. At least that's what we hope will happen. But the big vision goes back to that you know, self-sovereignty idea. Decentralized. No intermediary. Okay. Total market capitalization of blockchains at the moment is what? 0.5 trillion dollars. Internet one. We're in internet two. We might be going into internet three. This is close to your heart, no? So back to Anthony, because Anthony does a lot of stuff with standards. Okay, so we've been through a lot of stuff. I fully appreciate this. But uh, we've been throwing around words like Wild West quite a bit. And when you hear things like Wild West, you think a land of great opportunity, but also a land of great danger. And that is also where you start thinking about uh, how much danger is okay and should we be maybe regulating? Or should we maybe be standardizing to help things go better? Let's stick with the Wild West analogy. When we created the standard for rail and connected cities, that's when things really took off. So on the one hand, fragmentation brings great risks. I know we've solved this particular one by EU directive now, but how long did it take to get a standard mobile charger on our phones? And a lot of that fragmentation does unfortunately involve scams. So you probably have heard the word ICO, which is effectively a way of raising money for your new startup on the blockchain. For every ICO that is a real one and is creating a real product that will benefit real people, 
there is another three ICOs that are five guys getting together, raising money from people and disappearing, which is why you are seeing news item after news item talking about making ICOs just illegal because people don't know what they're investing in. So what do we do? Standards and regulation can hinder innovation. And as you saw from our presentation before, we've only started scratching the surface of what we can do with blockchain. We have a very, very simple implementation of putting signed signatures on the blockchain. All the really cool applications haven't been developed yet. And we need this vibrant ecosystem to actually develop them. So it's a very, very tricky thing. And here is a suggestion from our side based on where should that standardization, where should that regulation apply? So the first part of this is regulation of blockchain policy. And the scope of regulation should really be, first of all, to limit the proliferation of scams. I think it's very easy to say you're not allowed to promise people something, take their money and then disappear without making all of blockchain illegal. But also, it's all about legislating that solutions which the public or with public agencies work with should be solutions that have some kind of public social value, which is something I'll get into in a minute. The second level of regulation and standardization is actually standardization of educational ledgers. So what we're talking about here is standardizing the core information that goes into it. I gave the example before of ECTS. ECTS makes a perfect low-level blockchain implementation because ECTS already exists as a standardized system of tokens to represent educational credits. For lifelong learning, if we could find a way to tokenize it and standardize what those tokens mean, they, you could make a blockchain application based on it. If we talked about intellectual property, if we said, listen, our token is going to be one citation of an educational resource. If we say that will be the standard, and that is how the ledger will record the information, then you can start building things on top of it. And then for the third level, once you've standardized the base data, and once you've passed regulation to ensure that people don't get ripped off, then you basically need to let the market do its thing. Then developers can build applications on top of this. Once they have the standardized data, they can build all these cool ideas, not just the four scenarios we presented, but another 40 we haven't even thought about yet. And then the role of policymakers here really is just to help that process along and to actually stimulate that process. So if you're thinking about regulation and standardization and so on, this is at least our recommendation on how to go about it. Um, I mentioned that at nation state level, quite a few countries in Europe are already working towards this. Malta has a national blockchain strategy. This is the Dutch blockchain coalition that is actually doing something really cool because they are effectively running an entire startup incubator within the government and having blockchain projects compete with each other. And then the ones that go forward are evaluated on the basis of course technologically, but also of the social good and improvements they cause within the government. And that takes us to our key conclusions and recommendations. Now this is just a quick diagram of our conclusions and recommendations in the report. We have 14 conclusions, seven recommendations, and they're all linked to each other in the report. And we're not going to bore you by going through every single one of those. We're going to take you through what we consider the highlights, especially the highlights for you in the end as an audience of people who work within the commission and may have the chance to interact with these policies at some point. Now, first of all, all these recommendations come from one place, enhancing the social value proposition of blockchain. So if all of this is worth anything, it should bring concrete values to society, concrete values to people. And here we come back to the open versus closed blockchain argument. Now, one good way of thinking of open versus closed blockchains is to think of another word you may have heard of, which is greenwashing. So as soon as environmental concerns a few years ago became front in people's minds, companies had to deal with that. Now, if you're an oil company, there's only so much you can do to reduce your environmental footprint. So what you do, what do you do? You greenwash and you release marketing to say that natural gas is going to save the planet. 
It may be better than oil, but I think we can agree it still pollutes a fair amount. And effectively, this is what we are seeing a lot of companies in the blockchain space doing. So why are banks investing heavily in a technology that will get rid of their reason for existence? Simply enough, because what they're doing is they're putting in partial blockchain implementations, but they're not putting in the most important part, which is the decentralization part. And that way you can say, look, look, we're doing blockchain, and they've got more money to do blockchain bigger than anyone else, but not necessarily better than anyone else. So our first recommendation is saying that we should, that all EU and member state action should be directed to what we call open blockchain implementations. This means if you're funding blockchain, if you're working with blockchain companies, if you're paying for blockchain, it should be according to an open blockchain standard. And what would open blockchain mean? It would mean, first of all, recipient ownership, which means users would own their own data. Secondly, vendor independence, which essentially means that any application, if you change vendor, you can continue using your data. It isn't locked in. And thirdly, decentralized verification, which means that if a third party wants to check that data on the chain, they should be able to without having a gatekeeper in between. And these are the three main principles of open blockchain. If the EU were to say, listen, we are only going to work with providers that have solutions that are based on open blockchain, you've already pushed the social agenda of blockchain uh, eons forward. Secondly, commonly agreed technical standards. So as I mentioned, for blockchain implementations, you need tokenization standards. And simply enough, if you have tokenization standards for all types of educational credentials, then you can build blockchain applications with them. Now, we are fully aware that there's already work on this being done. The ESCO portal has released, I think, a 70-page metadata standard for actually digitally describing qualifications. Uh, we love it, but we would say it's a very good starting point. Uh, because that, those essentially describe, first of all, diploma degree level qualifications. Imagine if you extended that metadata standard to describe any type of learning taken from anywhere. And secondly, of course, this was a process started a few years ago when blockchain wasn't even on the agenda. If you took that process and just made it blockchain aware, and blockchain aware effectively means changing just a couple of items of the metadata standards to recognize that there are other types of databases than centralized ones, then you've got an already going process within the EU that could actually stimulate a large amount of blockchain innovation. Thirdly, a stakeholder-led approach. Now, I was giving all these really cool examples about universities running their own blockchain networks for credentials, open education repositories, running their own uh, blockchains for, uh, uh, for the sharing of citations, and so on and so forth. Um, all of those have one big caveat to them. And that is, if I went to a conference of universities and started talking about the blockchain, uh, most of them probably haven't even heard of it. The other third would think it's used for drug deals. And uh, the final third, their eyes would glaze over if I started the presentation. So it's fine saying that this, that this technology gives all these power to stakeholders, but stakeholders have to actually be empowered to take advantage of it. So one of the things we're saying here is effectively, if we want to form the stakeholder networks that can create their own blockchain networks, they need to be incentivized to do so. One of the instruments, since we're standing in this building, of course, Erasmus Plus and so on, it can be used to say, listen, we like the idea of a blockchain-led ECTS database. We would like a pilot for this, not from a company, from a stakeholder net network. Programming specifically designed to empower stakeholders to move their networks and move their transactions to a technology of distributed ledgers. I think it's interesting. Tony's now started talking about networks here. Um, and in a way, we, we're going to go back to this ideology bit. But if we can't speak about ideology in the EU, where, or the Commission, where, where should we be speaking about it? Because we can't have the same conversation in a in a vendor workshop, let's, let's, let's put it that way, okay. So the idea about setting up a coordination of actors 
or some sort of advisory board on the blockchain. And I understand something about fiefdoms and turf protectionism, by the way. Okay, I, 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 I advise a, a complex ministry and I know how difficult it is to get people from even different DGs potentially to collaborate and work together. But it's not just DGs, you need to reach out beyond the hallowed walls of uh, Brussels and Rue Joseph II. Um, so the idea of having representatives of people who are getting their hands dirty is what I'm talking about. Not necessarily just the researchers, but people trying to get things done, which is why Anthony mentioned that the Dutch, and the Dutch will be, will be speaking at our conference in, in May, but you know, people trying things out and failing gloriously. Um, cause so the, we're talking about comp you know, composed of representatives of national governments, educational stakeholders, and advisors, whatever we may mean by advisors. Okay. This should complement the work of the EU Blockchain Advisory Group and Forum, which is up there, up and running. Um, but it should focus on the coordination of efforts versus the information outpost, or let's try and be seen to be doing something. If it needs to be tied to money, funds, then put the funds to good use, sometimes for a change. Yep. The most difficult one. How do we reach out and have an informed public? You know, I'm trying to think of my 81-year-old dad, if I try to explain this to him. But I strip it down to the basis of the certificate and the two certificates he's got in his hall, which are on, you know, he gets that. Most parents get the notion of education. Most parents are investing a hell of a lot of money in their kids' education. If you strip it down to that basis, that's the kind of language that I had to use to try and convince anybody after the prime minister in my country that this was something worth investing in. You'll be surprised if you use a simple story sometimes that resonates with people's lives, that something as complicated as the blockchain suddenly starts to become very real as opposed to something esoteric or some crazies are trying somewhere or it's a bunch of crooks, okay? So we try to, we should allow for users to understand the differences, for, differences first between cryptocurrencies and blockchains, okay? We should understand the risks associated with cryptocurrencies. Nobody's saying it's a free lunch and the swings and roundabouts. I've met an equal amount of people who are absolutely convinced that the money that they have invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum is worth the future of their kids, as opposed to people who are saying they're all going to go away. It's a sham. I don't know. I can't give you advice on that. But there are very valid arguments for both. Inform yourself. I repeat, this whole training session has been about putting the technology to good use in education use, okay? We should evaluate the blockchain implications in terms of social good. I'm sorry, we keep on going back to that. If we can't look at education as a right, as a social good, and we, if we can't frame this in terms of a lifelong learning journey of plug and play education, where things are not necessarily in silos of higher education or VET or whatever it is the way we've siloed it, even within the European Commission. Some of the difficulties we've had in some of the working groups is, do we only look at education up to this bit when this other bit is conflating? And how can you tackle things at higher education when the rot sometimes happens at primary school? Okay. Social good. Understand the principle of self-sovereignty and how to apply it in practice on the web. Okay. These are compelling things. I want to leave you with this. John Perry Barlow, Barlow just died. For you guys who don't know his work, look, up, look him up. Look up the electronic frontier foundation. He died in his sleep last night. Um, he was one of the guys who fought and got excited for the notion of the internet and the open internet. So we'll leave you with a very emotional slant, but which would resonate with, with uh, Perry Barlow as he's on to his next journey. Okay? The, the blockchain might well be the last best chance we have to, to save the open web. Okay? And on that basis, we, we now stop the formal